Amen. All right, so now let's get in to the Word of God. This week while I was in prayer for you, asking God once again, what do you want to say to your people? What he said to my heart, I wrestled with for a few minutes. I was like, Lord, I've already taught on that. And, you know, people have heard that before, but I just knew it was the Lord. So I got into it and I got a word for you. And that is love. Today, I want to talk to you again as we look at Let Hope Arise. I want to talk to you about love. And here's the thing. It's got to be more than a feeling. Love has got to be more than a feeling. So... And I'm not just talking about human love. I'm talking about um, God's love. Love's got to be more than a feeling. God's love is more than a feeling. God is a God who actually manifests his love in myriads of different ways in our lives. And he wants you and I to do the same thing. Look, politics is not going to fix this mess. Power, position, prosperity, protesters police, policies, none of that's going to fix, fix this mess. It's not going to. There's only one thing that can fix this, and that is God's love. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today is the love of God. First of all, I want to do this. I want to do three things. One, I want to first expand our understanding, our minds. We've got to get God out of this tiny little box that we have him in. That's just the default position it is you, you have an encounter with God and it's, it's expansive. And then all of a sudden, you're, 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 you know, the box you have God in gets smaller and smaller based on the pressure of your situation. It's like, well, God can't do anything about this. First, I want to expand our minds with, that, with a powerful scripture. Secondly, I want to look at the power cell of how God is going to make the change, which is his love. Thirdly, I want us to look at how, what this looks like in practical daily life. Otherwise, it's useless, okay? So here we go. Here's our opening scripture. Love this scripture. Now, hope does not disappoint. Now, all of us have been disappointed by things we've hoped for. But this hope, God's hope, does not disappoint. Why? Well, he explains why. Because the love of God, that's a completely separate love than human love. It is a love from heaven. It's outside of our human experience unless God allows you to experience it. Then it becomes part of your human experience. But it doesn't come from human love. It comes from God. God is love. And you were made in his image. You were made from love and for love. That's why we don't function well without the love of God. So this hope is not disappointment. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, that's why this must start with the church. You see, it's followers of Jesus who the first thing God does when you give your life to his son, and you can do it right now while I'm preaching this message to you, you can just say, Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. I'm inviting you into my life. Forgive me for my sins. He will instantaneously. And you know the next thing he's going to do in a nanosecond? <sighs> He's going to breathe his spirit into your soul, into your heart. And you are going to be flooded with the love of God. I know you will. It happened to me. The scripture says it will happen. And after 35 years of ministry, I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people have it happen to them. This is our God. So it starts with the church. Now look at this scripture. Here's the scripture that will going to blow our minds. You ready? This is our foundation scripture. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This never runs out. Now many of you have heard this scripture a thousand times, but we're going to break it down. All right, here we go. First of all, it says that he is able to do. God is not just a God. Deism teaches that God slung the universes into existence. He made the world. He made the human race. Then he just backed out and just slung it into existence, let it spin, but he's not involved in our lives. That's horrible. What a horrible, unrighteous, untrue lie of a philosophy about our God. That means he's a negligent father. And he is not. He's a very attentive father. Do not believe that lie. That's trash. 
God made you. God made the world. He cares so intimately about every person, everything, every creature, everybody. God is a doing God, not a passive God. He is able to do. In fact, you know one of his names is El Shaddai, the all-powerful God. Not some power, not a little bit of power, all power. That means this mess in our nation and the world is not bigger than his power. You see, God is a doing God, and he can do anything. You know, God made us as human beings, and of course our worth comes from the fact that we are beings made in his image, but he didn't just make us human beings, he also made us human doings. You see, look, if you don't do something with your life, you're, you're, not, you're not worth much. Really, I mean, think about it. You say, oh, that's offensive. Wait a minute. What, what if you have a do-nothing husband? Hmm. Well, you just said it doesn't really matter if you do much, right? What if you have a do-nothing wife? What if you have a do-nothing employees? Do-nothing boss? What if you have, on a sports team, you have a do-nothing coach? What if you're a coach, you have do-nothing players? Do-nothing employees? Do-nothing friends, right? You see, you and I were created to actually do, to create, to problem solve, to make a difference. We're made in God's image. God is a doing God, and he can do anything. Okay, so let's look at some of these amazing words in this passage. First, let's look at the word abundantly. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Okay, you ready for this? It's going to blow your mind. That word abundantly is superabundance excessive excessive people say well that's excessive you know we look at somebody's house these wealthy you know uh hollywood actors or or uh hip-hop artists or billionaires we look at their homes you know you look at extreme homes on the television like oh my gosh that's excessive excessive look at these words I'm talking about god of super abundance excessive overflowing that's like a river that overflows the banks and floods a town surplus. That's like when the government actually balances the budget and we have a surplus of millions and millions and billions of dollars. It's happened a couple times in our nation. You have a surplus. It's more than enough. Watch this. It means profuse. We use that in the negative term because it's just so much is profuse. We're talking about God is profuse and extraordinary. Okay. Now that makes some of you uncomfortable. Well, you're going to have to get comfortable with it because this is our God we're talking about. You're going to have to get comfortable with the fact that God is super abundant, excessive, overflowing, surplus, more than enough for profuse and extraordinary. Now, if that's not offensive, if that doesn't make you uncomfortable, look at the word they tagged on to it. The Holy Spirit tags on the word exceedingly abundantly. This means to an extreme degree. So everything I just said, the profuse, the extraordinary, the more than enough, the surplus, the excessive, now you have to add to an extreme degree. <laughs> this is our God. Come on. Come on. What are you believing God for? Is it tiny? Don't offend him with small prayers. Pray these big, massive, crazy prayers, these excessive prayers, these profuse prayers, these extraordinary prayers, so our God can do extraordinary things. And then the next word is all. Now, this is a difficult word in the Greek. I looked it up. It took me a long time to finally realize what it was actually meaning. And that is, it means all. All. He can do all that you ask. You know what this word ask means? It means insistent asking without qualms. It means this. Hey, I want, I need. Hey, hey. Hey, 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 I want, I need, I want, I need, hey, hey. That's what that means. That's what <laughs> Jesus taught him. When he said, when he said, ask, seek, knock, that word ask means ask and keep on asking. And then he gives a parable about a friend that goes to a friend that says, hey, I need some bread. And he goes, I'll go get you something. He goes to his friend's house at midnight, bam, 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 on the door. And the guy inside says, shut Leave me alone. Me and my family are sleeping. Uh, no, I need, I want, I need some bread. I need, and it, was, it wasn't for him. It was for a buddy. He was interceding. He was gapping between heaven and the need of a, of a friend. That's an intercessor. That's a go-between. That's what the church is, calling heaven on earth. God, you got to fix this thing. God, you got to invade the White House. 
God, you got to invade the Democrats and the Republicans. you got to invade the police force and invade the protesters, invade the economy, invade the church. God, we need you. That's what that is. And you keep asking, you keep asking. Jo Pastor Josh and I were praying before this service, and he started praying about Elijah. Man, praying for it to rain after three and a half years of drought. And he said to his servant, go see if the rain has come. And he goes out there, looks at the sea. He was looking for a little cloud coming out of the sea. You see anything? The guy says, no, probably not going to happen. Elijah says, shut up. I'm going to pray again. He prayed, go look again. No, no, go look again. No, no, nothing, nothing, nothing is getting worse. What, huh, what? Go, go. He kept praying because he knew God's will and he wouldn't stop until he got it. God said he was going to do it. So what's he doing praying so much? That's the way it works. That's why we did the We Pray San Diego, 7,000 believers on their knees at 11 different locations throughout the city, calling out for God. Now it's spreading across the nation until there's a little hand coming out of the sea in the book of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. The little hand coming out of the sea. And he said, okay, you better run for shelter because the rain's coming. And then it poured. That's the way God does it. He's going to come through. He's going to break through our situation. And then... He does above and all we ask or even think. That word think means to imagine. You can't even imagine what America is going to be like. You think you can imagine, but when God's glory is revealed, when God does what he's going to do, you can't even imagine how good it's going to be. You, you think you can imagine the things in your life panning out the way that you hope it's going to be beyond that. There's no way that Peter imagined as a fisherman that he was going to be an apostle of the church and they're going to be building statues then and that his shadow was going to heal people. The apostle Paul couldn't have imagined that he was going to be the, the, the most prolific apostle that's ever been, writing two-thirds of the New Testament. David, a little teenager playing his guitar and taking care of the sheep, could never have imagined that he was going to be Israel's greatest king. You cannot imagine what God would do with your life if you'll turn it over to him completely and trust him. This is some good preaching right here, huh, Pastor Josh? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, that's what I'm talking about. It's the <laughs> word of God. Come on. And then it's all according to something. It's according to the power that works within us. So that expands our understanding. A little shot in the arm there to quit thinking small things like your big God. But what is the power that he's talking about? What is the power that he's talking about? Well, it's the love of Christ. That's the power within us that causes all of this to happen. I'm going to back up in the passage, and I'm just, you're going to see what I'm talking about. We just read how he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that works within you. But right before that, he explains the power cell that generates that, that's the catalyst that makes that possible. And here it is. Ready? In Ephesians chapter 3, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You no, you don't realize what he's saying right here because he says the passes are understanding. You know, we sold uh, something on Craigslist. We were selling something on Craigslist this last week. So I had to go measure it. It was a desk. So I get out there and I get the, I get the uh, measuring tape and I go, okay, what's the length? Okay, what's the width? Okay, what's the depth? Okay, what's the height? Okay, there it is right there. Okay, if you try to do that with the love of Christ for you, you try to do that with the love of Christ, you try to measure it, it's immeasurable. If you were able to measure, I'm, this, I'm serious, you remember the excessive, the profuse, the extraordinary? If you were able, if the, astro, astro, um, the astronomers were able to measure from one end of the universe to the other, which they can't, because it's still expanding, that still would not be the measure of Christ's love for you. <laughs> yeah, it's beyond our understanding. That's why it says we have to experience the love of Christ. You have to experience it. I was, uh, I was uh, doing a little Bible study. We're not ready for that yet. 
we were doing a, a Bible study. I was doing a Bible study this week with my two of my teenage boys. And we were looking at the parable or the story where Jesus was uh, at a Pharisee's house, a religious leader's house. And then this woman who used to be a prostitute came in and she falls down at Jesus' feet and she, she weeps and uh, she anoints his head with oil, weeps over his feet, washes his feet with her hair. The Pharisee, who is supposed to know God, and yet God is sitting at his dinner table and he doesn't even, doesn't even know him. He teaches about God in the temple. He knows the Bible, but he doesn't even know God. How do you know? Because God was sitting at his dinner table and he didn't even recognize him. But this prostitute, this former prostitute did because Jesus touched her life and transformed her. She busts in uninvited to this religious leader's home who would have nothing to do with her and weeps over Jesus' feet. And I was asking my teenage boys, what do you think is going on there? And we had to talk about the difference between PKs, preacher's kids, growing up in a preacher's family in church thinking they know Jesus. Oh, they know all the terminology. They know all the jargon, right? They might even speak in tongues. But do you know him? See, this is what I say when I get into uh, religious discussions with people and they start talking about Christianity as a philosophy, as a religion, and all these different religions, all I say is you've never met him. You, you, just, you just haven't met him. You don't know him. Him, not a religion, not Christianity, Jesus. That was the difference between that woman and the Pharisee. She had met him and her life was changed. That's the knowing, the love of Christ he's talking about here. And that's the result, is the worship. So, why is love the power set that causes this all to happen? One, we're going to talk about the love for you. When you understand of how much God loves you, it releases the mountain-moving faith that already resides inside of you. Why? Because the scripture says this, perfect love casts out all fear. When you have a mature, perfect revelation of the love of Christ for you, all fear is gone. You're not afraid of God. We're not, you, you keep your distance from somebody that you're not sure about. But when you know that this person loves you through and through, sees all your warts, all your uglies, all your sin, and still loves you unaccepted and un, 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 uh, unconditionally, and you know that, and then you know how big he is and how much of a giver he is, then you ask without qualms. That's why love is the power cell that enables God to do whatever uh, above and beyond what you can ask to think is because you understand his love for you. So you're not intimidated in his presence and you ask these big fat prayers that offend everybody else around you. That's what I'm talking about. It also sets you free from the fear of man, the opinions of others. This is huge. Look at what the scripture says. For God has not given you, Paul was writing this to Timothy, who had, a, who had a fear problem with the opinions of people in his church. And the apostle Paul says, But God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Saying, Timothy, this spirit that you're bound with is not a spirit from God. It's a spirit of fear. But God hasn't given you that spirit. God's given you another spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love. It's a spirit. I told you that. It's, it's beyond us. The Holy Spirit's love shed abroad in your heart, Timothy. It's a spirit of love and power and of a sound, undisturbed mind. When you get caught up in that reality that you're a well-loved child of God, I'm telling you, your worth and your identity is settled. Here are three things that make up your self-worth, and we're going, to to, we're going to shift to the next point. Number one, when you understand the love of God, you realize who you are, and that is you're made in the image of God. Image is huge in our culture. Let me tell you something. Your outer image, which is what our culture is all about, and these young girls that are just completely twisted in their minds because they're looking on Instagram and they see all these posts and they just try to compete, and, they, and, they, and the boys that are into uh, pornography and looking at all the images of women and stuff, and it's just this total distortion of our worth. Because look, your outer image is part of you, but it's a very small part of you. The big mammoth part of you is on the inside. Who you are on the inside, made in the image of God. That's your intellect, your creativity, your personality, your heart. 
You're caring for others. Your character. That's the massive part of you. The outside is just like, like well, skin deep. Now one day it's all just going to go back down to the dirt. That's all it is. It's the dirt. But the inside of your soul lives on forever. That's why we got to re reverse our priority from focus on the outside to the inside. Come on. Somebody say amen right now. Somebody's getting set free right there. So number one, it's who you are. Secondly, uh, the love of God reveals to you what you're capable of. You see, you're made in God's image, and that means you are capable of extreme creativity, ingenuity, extreme love, extreme um, giftings, and, and uh, your ability to accomplish things in life. You know, maybe people didn't tell you that about yourself that you were made from love, by love, and that you're incredible, made in his image. I tell you, as I mentor young, men, uh, young sons and daughters in the faith, when I see that their insecurities, but I see God's potential in them, I see God's image in them, they don't see it, but after the uh, years of encouraging them and watching them come into the fullness of who God created them to be, it's the greatest reward a mentor has in life is to see these young men and women come into confidence that they are made in God's image and that they have worth. And then thirdly, what you actually do with that. And this is the most common question people ask you, right? When they meet you, they say, so what do you do? It's a legit question because you're not just a human being. You're a human doing. You have all these great capabilities. What are you doing with it? Well, I want to say this. No matter what your occupation is, what you do within what you do is what really matters. In other words, if you're a teacher or you're a plumber or you are a CEO or you're a custodian or you're an Uber driver, or you're a student, or you're a mom or dad, whatever you are occupationally and functioning in life, what you do within what you do is what matters, and that is how you love others. And that's the second thing we want to go to here, is Christ's love for others. Now, this is where the rubber's going to meet the road. When you, I told you at the beginning of this, that it's the love of God that is going to fix our world. And it begins with you. I want, you know, you wonder, maybe Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, the entire Bible rests on these two commands. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if we would just do that, this would all be solved. If the Democrats would love the Republicans, the Republicans love the Democrats, I mean, like, really love them with the love of God, it would all be solved, right? If the protesters love the police, and the police love the protesters, right? If the police officer that did what he did to George Floyd, loved him, he never would have done it. Love solves everything. The love of God. That's why we don't function well without it. So once you experience the love for yourself, the actual love of Christ, now you have love to give to others. Look what the Bible says. Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us. That word compel means a tight grip that prevents escape. How many of you have a little dog and you have a little uh, toy that you give to him? Maybe that little rope. And he gets it in his teeth. Like, and you grab it. And you try to yank it around. You can literally hold the dog up in the air by the rope. right? And he's dangling. Like, he's not letting go of it. That's what this word means. It means that he's gripped it so tight that you cannot yank it out of him. The Apostle Paul says, The love of Christ has gripped me so tightly for you, I cannot get away from loving you. That's what he's saying here. That's what the love of Christ does to us. It does not allow us to escape loving others. So when we talk about others, though, what are we talking about? Who are the others? Well, we can generalize and we can say, you know, well, everybody in the world, you know, the others. I, I just love everybody. No, you don't. Oh, oh, yes, I do. I'm a Christian. I love everybody. Really? Do you love Hitler? Oh, 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 oh. Well, um, oh, really? Do you love the... Uh, White supremacists? Do you love the, the organizers of Black Lives Matter's organization? Do you love President Trump? Do you love Pelosi? Do you love McConnell? Do you love people who have wounded you and hurt you? See, you don't love everybody. That's okay. Just be honest about it. But Jesus does. And that's the point. Jesus is other than us. He's so far beyond us. And he will pour his love through you to everyone. Because you know who Jesus calls 
all these people, whether they're white, yellow, brown, green, purple, male, female, young, old, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, illegal, legal. You know, Jesus calls the other your neighbor. Everyone's your neighbor. Jesus said, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. You see, it's got to begin with the church. And for those of you who say, well, I do love people. I really, really do. Well, what have you done to prove that? Because love is not known until it is shown. Love is not known until it is shown. You see, love is more than a feeling. Love has got to be more than a feeling. Love is sacrifice. God so loved the world that he sat back and said, Ooh, I got a good feeling about the world. Oh, I just feel this love for everybody in the world. No, that's not what it said. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he what? Gave. You see, Love is action. Look at the Bible says about this. This is how we have discovered love's reality. Jesus sacrificed his life for us because of this great love. We should be willing to lay down our lives for one another. If anyone sees a fellow believer in need and has the, has the means to help him, yet shows no pity and closes his heart against him, so you can close your heart. Some of you have closed your heart against white people, against black people, against rich people, against poor people against people on the other side of the political spectrum, you have closed your heart to them. And Jesus wants you to open it so he can love them through you. How is it even possible, he says, that God's love lives in you? Beloved children, our love can't be an abstract theory we only talk about, but a way of life demonstrated through our loving deeds. I want to say it again. Love is not known until it is shown. Love is sacrifice. Love is not known until it is shown. Love equals sacrifice. Maybe it's giving your time, your money, your prayers. Or maybe it's giving up your pride, your opinions, winning an argument. Maybe it's giving up bitterness, unforgiveness, woundedness. You see, love gives. Love yields. Love listens. Loving others begins with your attitude toward them. And I'm going to bring this to a, a close in just about five minutes. So we're going to wrap this up. But I hope this is penetrating your heart. This is the hope of the world. It always has been and always will be. In every generation, the love of God hitting the planet is the hope of the world. And he does it through his people. You have had past experiences and upbringings in education that have shaped your attitudes toward women, toward men, toward black people, white people, Asian Muslims, Christians, Jews, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, moms, dad, teens, kids. You have had experiences. You have been brought up in family units that have shaped your perspective. You have been influenced by media, by movies and television, by social media, and you have a perception of groups of people. You might say you don't, but you do. You know, my, my sister Renee, she was a psychology, or is a psychology professor, and she did this experiment with her, her freshman class one time. She told them she was going to have a substitute teacher came in, and she told the class some negative things about the teacher. I don't really like this person. They're kind of this and this. And then they... She brought in the substitute teacher, and then she had feedback forms. What did you guys think of the substitute teacher? Oh, no, it was all negative. Then she did the exact same thing with her second class. And she, the same substitute teacher, said, this guy's great. You're going to love him. And when she got the feedback forms, it was all positive. What is that called? Prejudging. It's prejudice. It's hearing somebody's perception of someone else or another people group. And you hear it over and over and over, and it literally shapes your mind to be prejudiced, prejudging somebody or a group of people before you ever encounter them yourself. We all do it. <clears throat> it's called racism. That's what it is. It's prejudice. 
Here's an example in our own life. We had a woman actually confront my wife and I in a restaurant and told us that we adopted our black son and our Asian son out of white guilt. She didn't know us. She's never even talked to us before. But we have white skin. And so we adopted them out of white guilt. I thought it was because Jesus appeared to my wife in a dream while she was a missionary in the Philippines with two special needs children on the floor, babies, in their own excrement. And Jesus says, will you take care of them for me? I thought that's where it came from. But no, according to this woman, she prejudged us, didn't even know us. See, that is sin, is what that is. And we all do it. I believe this is a huge key, that you and I must allow every person to disclose who they are to you. You and I must allow every person to disclose for themselves who they are to you. If she heard our story, she probably would have just been blown away, because I don't think Jesus did that out of white guilt. Right? You got to let people tell you who they are, not assume who they are. This is what love does. I love this quote by Miles McPherson. If you do not honor others, what you are saying is that the image of God in you is worth more than the image of God in them. We're all made in the image of God. Everyone shares the same makeup you do. We have to be the bridge. I'm going to close with this great testimony, the true story. An Armenian nurse had been held captive along with her brother by the Turks. Her brother was slain by a Turkish soldier before her eyes. Could you imagine? Could you imagine watching your brother or sister slain by someone on the other side of the, of the uh, battle, right in front of you? Somehow she escaped and later became a nurse in a military hospital. One day she was stunned to find that the same man who had killed her brother had been captured and brought wounded to the hospital where she worked. Something within her cried out, Vengeance! But a stronger voice called for her to love. She nursed the man back to earth, back to health, back to earth. She nursed the man back to health. Finally, the... the a uh, recuperating soldier asked her, why didn't you let me die? Her answer was, I'm a follower of him who said, love your enemies and do good to them who hate you. Impressed with her answer, the young soldier replied, I have never heard such words before. Tell me more. I want this kind of religion. Now I'm going to read you the last scripture in this passage. Go all the way to the end. In the very last scripture, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, I want to say to everyone listening to me, right? Boy, girl, white, black, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, protesters, police officers, Republican, Democrat, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, our identity is not in our skin color. Our identity is not in our political party. Our identity is not in our sexuality. Our identity is not in our human history. Our identity is in Jesus. Look what this says. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all, say it out loud, one in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for you. And then Josh is going to lead us in a closing song. I hope this has struck your heart. Then you wrestle with it. And then you let Jesus rout out and root out all the ugly and out of your heart. Because you got to be a pure vessel for God to flow through. I've stopped watching the news, social media, and all that. It's just people's prejudging one another. And it fills your heart and your mind with crud. Every once in a while, I dip in to see what's going on. But I do not spend a whole lot of time there. I want to encourage you to spend more time with Jesus. Lord, I pray for your precious people, your church. I pray that they will be filled with the spirit of the love of God so we can be the healing agent in the earth. You might know somebody that you've prejudged. You might want to stop that and go to them, ask them to forgive you, and begin healing relationships. Joshua, will you lead us in a closing song?
shall come with trumpet sound. new height, new depth, new levels of understanding of your love. 